This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And uh, good morning to everyone who's on uh, by live streaming. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us too. Uh, just say, say something in the comment line to let us know you're here. Um, if you are a visitor or a guest and we don't have any contact information for you, please leave it for us on a note in the just where you're sitting. Uh, there are little pads called Piddlin' Pads for Presbyterians in the back of most of the uh, pews in front of you, so you could just grab one of those little pieces of paper and let us know who you are. Um, uh, I'm Marion Taylor, pastor here, and uh, we have a special guest musician today. I wanted to make special notice of that. Uh, John Avent here, uh, he's a member of First Christian Church. Uh, it has also a great history here with this church, including marriage to star alto Beth Avent. <laughs> um, and he is also the treasurer of Rosam, uh, board member of Rosam. So uh, we have lots of connections with John. I heard him rehearsing with Roland earlier this week. Uh, I was in my office and I could hear, and at first I thought it was a cello playing. It's just such a mellow, sweet, continuous sound that John gets from his saxophone. So welcome, John. Um, the youth group has a novel new way of raising funds, and cooperating with them will be very easy. If you make a purchase that you were going to make anyway, just hang on to the receipt. And if you don't really need that receipt, you can hand it over to uh, Jason or Rachel. Uh, it's a program uh, where the companies are interested in that feedback and they want to re offer rewards, obviously, for using their stores. And so they'll give points that can be cashed in for the youth group. Um, so you don't have to sort out the receipts. We, we happen to know that Kroger, Costco, and a lot of restaurants are participating. But don't worry about who's participating. The Shaws will sort that out. Just hand them your receipts and thanks in advance. Um, Christian Education and Nurture uh, Committee's meeting today, even if you're not on that committee, if there's something that says to you, I'd like to be part of the education program uh, for the children of this church, uh, they're always looking for volunteers. So if, you, if you're interested, please let them know. Um, and then finally, there's something that we were going to do after this sermon, uh, kind of a series right now we're calling Outreach Inspirations. Uh, where we're going to just celebrate the ways that um, our outreach committee, but also individual members of the church are connected to charitable work here in the, in the community. And because, for an extremely good reason, uh, Rob Moore needs to go ahead and do that today on behalf of uh, the Access uh, Men's Shelter, because he's on duty at the Access Men's Shelter and needs to get over there. So you couldn't be a better example, uh, Rob. Uh, do you want the pulpit or you want the uh, lectern? Okay, uh, Tim, uh, Rob's gonna use this microphone. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm here uh, to give a minute uh, permission on behalf of Access Frankfurt. And of course, most of, the, of us know that as the uh, soup kitchen and men's shelter. And of course, the soup kitchen, if you don't know where it is, it's at the end of the alley that runs by our church. And the mission of the soup kitchen and men's shelter is to, one, provide one nutritious meal each day to needy people in Frankfort and Franklin County. And uh, for example, today, uh, corn chowder is being served. <laughs> and then the second thing is to provide a safe place for homeless men to find shelter. In fact, we provide beds each night for up to 16 uh, homeless men, and we also provide these people with uh, three meals each day. And then when uh, weather conditions are bad, like it, when it's 10 degrees or 20 degrees in the winter, uh, many more men uh, stay with us overnight. Now, they're not allowed to have a bed uh, due to uh, fire regulations, but they are allowed to come in and stay warm. Uh, South Frankfurt Presbyterian <coughs> Church and our members have had a long tradition of supporting uh, the soup kitchen, and we've supported that with donations, 
We've supported it. If you'll remember, we allowed uh, the soup kitchen to actually use our kitchen and fellowship hall when their facility was undergoing renovation. We've actually worked uh, by serving lunches at the, at the soup kitchen. And then I know uh, at least my daughter and others from this church actually painted a mural uh, on the inside walls at the soup kitchen many years ago. So we've, we've uh, connected with the soup kitchen for years. And uh, the reason I'm here today is not only to tell you about the soup kitchen, but also to let you know uh, and ask you to continue to uh, let you know of a need and to ask you to continue to support the soup kitchen. Uh, one, with monetary donations. And uh, if you do make a monetary donation, I can uh, promise you that that money will be put to good use. And those donations could be made online or through the church. Or two, uh, working to serve lunches uh, at the soup kitchen. And I'll talk to the uh, people that were involved with that previously to see if we can get that effort started back up now that COVID seems to be uh, on the wane. Uh, and then three, uh, by participating in the Walk of Awareness on Thanksgiving uh, morning. Each Thanksgiving, uh, the Walk of Awareness occurs, and it's been a great fundraiser for the soup kitchen for many years. Uh, I would say, uh, one, I'm on the board of the soup kitchen, and we could not provide any of this support to these needy, needy folks without your support and without the support of many others. Uh, and of course, your generous support will help us to continue to provide this service. Uh, of course, a minute for mission always have, has to have a good, relevant Bible verse. So I'm going to quote from Proverbs uh, 19, verse 17, which says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and will be repaid in full. So. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your consideration, and the soup kitchen appreciates your consideration. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Um, it's very inspiring. And let's continue to uh, let ourselves be inspired as Roland plays the organ.
in body or in spirit, please stand with the choir uh, for our call to worship. With all our heart and with all our soul, with all our mind and might, we come to love the Lord our God, the source of truth and life. We offer honor, thanks, and praise to God, the giver of our days. <clears throat> how recent the um, text is for that first hymn written by David Gambrell. I happen to know David. He uh, works for the worship department of our denomination as a uh, very prolific. So it's, it's wonderful to think of our hymnal as a living document, which it is. We always come to this point, you know, early in a service when uh, our inspiration and thinking about how perfect God is makes us want to confess that uh, we're not so perfect and that we need God's help. So uh, God just asks that we open ourselves to the changes that God wants for us. Uh, so let's join now in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, you offer us your bountiful grace and invite us to partake of your goodness, but we make excuses to turn away or avoid your invitation. We often rely on our own sufficiency rather than receive from your grace what is most sufficient for our own souls. We would rather go it alone than be in community with others in need of your grace. May we, in the silence, become aware of our own insufficiency and excuses. God's Spirit is at work to form us into faithful followers. Our sins are forgotten. Only invitation remains. Thanks be to God.
So very uplifting. Thank you. Uh, if any children haven't already made their way to the front pew, this is a good time to do that. And our messenger this morning is Beth Metzger. All right, hang on. A couple more coming up. Yeah. That's good because there's a little gift this morning. I love that stuffed animal. Good morning. So do you all like to play hide and go seek? Yeah. Yeah. When you played it, have you ever worried that you wouldn't be found by the seeker? The reason why I'm asking this is when I was little, yeah, I know it was a very long time ago. Um, when I was very, when I was little, I lived in a town that was much smaller than Frankfurt. And the kids in my neighborhood liked to play hide and seek in the dark. Um, <clears throat> the seeker would be the only one who, who would have a flashlight like this one. Even though the darkness made it easier for us to hide, it made getting found even harder. There were times I'd get nervous that I wouldn't get found. Maybe I hit so well that the seeker would just give up looking for me after finding everyone else. In a way, I would be, I would be lost. Jesus talked about the importance of finding everyone who's been lost. Today's scripture is about a story he told about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. Ninety-nine were with him but there was one who was lost. Jesus didn't say it was okay to let the one sheep remain lost. He talked about the shepherd leaving the 99 to go find the lost one. That's a scary thing for a shepherd to do because that's the way he earns money, by raising his sheep. What if something happened to the big group while he was gone? He'd lose a lot of money. Is it wise to run the risk? Jesus says it is. You see, he taught that everyone is important. Sheep in a group of 99 aren't any more important than the lost one. They're all equally important, just like everyone else, including those playing hide and seek. Now, I don't have flashlights for everybody. What I do have are some pretty cool glow-in-the-dark bracelets. So, Ms. Sawyer, could you help pass these out, please? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You have like a hundred of those? Well, you have a hundred and one now, okay? Um, and when you look at that bracelet, just remember that you are important enough to be found, just like that one lost sheep. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for loving us. Help us to remember that everyone is important especially those who are lost. Amen. Now, on three, I want all of the kids to say with me out to the congregation. Everybody stand up real quick. And on three, we're going to say, God be with you. Okay? One, two, three. God be with you. God be with us all. Thank you. <laughs> Oops. It's a little bit.
want a little small for my arm. Please join me in the reading of the prayer for, of illumination in the bulletin. O oh God, may your word bear fruit in our hearts, minds, and actions. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Now all the tax, tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep that was lost. And so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, <clears throat> and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to God. be to God. It goes with that, which I'll explain in a minute. There we go. Well, by now, quite a few of you already know that uh, in July, I went to the emergency room, uh, and that from there, I was transferred by ambulance to a hospital in Louisville for tests. It, it was a combination of palpitations, flutter, and affibrillation that had gone on quite a while and was making me pretty sick. And I'd been ignoring uh, the need to see a doctor about these episodes. Well, all is well. I have a cardiologist now. Uh, my stress test showed that my heart is normal, uh, so now I can just take an anticoagulant and get on with things, right? Well, I, I kind of had to tell you about that in order to tell you about the interesting people I met that day. <laughs> of the four persons who gave me the most care in the ER and in the ambulance, two of them, fully half, had been in the military in the Middle East. It's uh, probably not just a happenstance, don't you think? I mean having a clear mission to save and stabilize someone under urgent conditions, that might feel pretty familiar to someone with combat experience. I enjoy getting to know them, and I'm very grateful that they like their line of work. However, I am not like them. By temperament, I like to be able to plan ahead to pace myself and not feel last minute pressure. Adrenaline rushes are not for me. So Jesus' teaching for today reminded me a bit of ambulance work. Until this week, I've always read the story of the Good Shepherd going into the wilderness, exclusively from the perspective of the saved sheep. It moves me every time, this image of a caring, strong, knowledgeable stand-in for God, being braving every inconvenience to come and save me or someone else. 
maybe not in an ambulance, but by whatever means are available. Well, I'm not the only one moved by it. It's the subject of so many great paintings, including this lovely one that hangs here on our church hall wall. Just as the first thing you see when you emerge from the sanctuary going toward the fellowship hall. Um, I've, I've mainly seen this message in the story, that God will go to any lengths to come and to, to us and to save us, including coming to us in Jesus. In fact, one day, not knowing what words to say in prayer, it came to me that I could just say, bah, so I did. <laughs> This week, I wondered for the first time whether the meaning of that story might be also that the church needs to be more willing to go into the wildernesses to find people where they are. And, and there's some truth to that. And I give thanks for the ways that we do do that through specialized ministries like the one that Rob Moore told us about just this morning. Congregations, uh, historically, just like the monasteries of old, have always had to organize ourselves so that all of our mission can be pursued, whether that's educating children in the faith, to praying and singing together, re to reaching out to people in trouble. So some lines, or at least dotted lines, have always been drawn between those different kinds of activities and for good reasons. But this thought, the thought that I personally should be more like the Good Shepherd in going out into our urban wilderness, made me feel kind of guilty. Suddenly I felt bad for not being called to the church equivalent of ambulance work. Until I noticed something from the context of today's reading. Here it is. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. They came to him. This story is not about Jesus or his followers pursuing people in odd places and rushing them to safety as much as it's about the attraction of his message to those who want to hear it and need to hear it. A message about the nature of God. And it's about what sort of person finds this message compellingly attractive. Jesus knew that perceptions of this message would vary depending on which of the characters in this parable a listener might see as representing themselves. And so he created a sort of crisis for his listeners. Unless you identify with the shepherd, you only have two choices. You can identify with the lost sheep, by which he clearly means sinners, or you can identify with the 99 sheep who were left in the wilderness without protection, just because one sheep wandered off. That's what Jesus figured out about the religious leaders who grumbled about him. And they were there that day, grumbling. They felt neglected, unjustly neglected. They felt angry at those foolish and bad sheep. They did not see themselves as sinners, but as people who were offended by sinners. Those who do not see themselves as sinners think they deserve a reward. In this case, I think the critically minded observers probably wanted special attention from this great moral teacher, Jesus. He should be picking their brains about every subject, having great conversations in which there would be mutual recognition as spiritual leaders. Oh, what a treat to host such an evening with an itinerant rabbi like Jesus. People would talk about it for days, weeks. 
In Jewish circles, what you did for a living was just a necessity, but the time you spent with other men becoming learned and discussing the interpretation of God's holy scriptures, that was pure privilege and joy. Jesus should be locked head to head with people who understood that. Why was he wasting time with these tax collectors and sinners who obviously have other priorities? In contrast, from the perspective of the sheep that is isolated from others because of making a mistake, there's only good news. And this generous man, Jesus, is bringing it. That's why they flocked to him that day. The good news is that we are all so precious in God's sight that God will pursue us endlessly. And not only that, God's joy will be over the top when we return to God's embrace. Jesus, the genius storyteller, created a situation in which the observers could go on thinking that they were sinless if they insisted on it, but he was signaling to those among them who were willing to hear it that they too were among the precious lost ones, humans in need of a savior, and that God wanted to celebrate their return too. They were lost only because they believed they were not. God sent Jesus to woo them back from the dry spiritual wilderness where they had started living. If they would but just realize it, the shepherd had arrived and his shoulders were ready for them too. Well, folks, what if this powerful message of love and grace and humility could reach every human being? Imagine it. In such a world, the expression 9-11 would have no special meaning to us. Today's the first time since I've been the pastor here that a Sunday has fallen on the anniversary of that horrible day in 2001 when thousands of ordinary people like you and me were targeted by terrorists a day of sirens from ambulances and fire trucks and more. The mentality of the perpetrators and those who sent them, their justification for their actions, started with a thought not so very different from the one that was grumbled within Jesus's earshot that day long ago. This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Somehow, not just the United States, but everyone who benefited from life in the United States became the other, the sinner in this ideology. And so if you were in those towers or on those airplanes or in the Pentagon or on, in another target, you were somehow a collaborator a sinner beyond saving, and the hijackers saw themselves as sinless by contrast. I don't know what makes a person come to think in such absolutes that they're willing to kill, but it happens a lot. The phrase 9-11 just signals the, for us the vulnerability that we hadn't much thought about before. But mass shootings and war crimes all remind us that this mindset's extremely dangerous and it's taken a bit of a hold in many quarters. Define sinners as someone other than yourself, then ostracize them and isolate yourself from them. The next step might just be to eliminate them. Well, I don't know how the mindset develops, but I do know the antidote. It's widely known. The greatest antidote is to be befriended by someone who is gracious and kind.
the power of being befriended is very great, especially at those most vulnerable moments in life when one, for instance, may have wandered off. Thanks to an article in the State Journal this week, Frankfurt learned something about one of its newer pastors. Uh, it was an article written by someone in Florida who had worked with Dr. Rosby Glover uh, when he lived there before coming here to First Baptist on Clinton Street. He was the executive of an organization called Prevention Central. Think about that name, Prevention Central. Here is what his fellow board member wrote about his work there, what the board member did. She said, under his leadership, thousands of families found a safer path through early intervention for troubled youth, family counseling, a food pantry, housing, parent education, mentoring, and so much more. Beyond all direct services and material support, Dr. Glover dispensed hope and dignity to all. His daily example of believing in the worth of all people, especially those unable to believe in themselves, undoubtedly saved countless lives." End of quote. Well, Prevention Central sounds great, and it serves to remind us of all the similar befriending that's done here in Frankfurt. Rob told us about the access shelter. That's a very good example. Teachers in our schools are busy every day extending a friendly mentoring relationship to children who face all sorts of difficulties. Some people come to church lonely and leave knowing love and friendship. This is the antidote. Welcoming sinners and eating with them is the solution, not the problem. If you are lost, I hope that you know you are. Because if you know you're lost, then you're in a position to hear the greatest news ever told. At the heart of this universe is a God who creates, who loves, who forgives, who saves. Forget any view of God you ever had that might cast the divine being as remote and unfeeling and judgmental and punitive. Jesus knew God better than we do. And Jesus said God is like a shepherd who goes to the greatest lengths to find anyone who's alone, or like a woman who's lost a coin and goes to great lengths to find it. This is a God who prefers to come find you and embrace you and throw a party for you. Want to save the world? Whether or not you're suited for the ambulance work, you can befriend people, pass this good news along, and save lives. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Dear God, even when parts of our lives seem in good order, there can still be parts where we know we're lost. Maybe we've made mistakes. Maybe we're caught up in something bad. Maybe we're just confused. Come and find us, we pray, and make us glad for others that you have found already. Amen.
let's have a time of prayer together now as we pray for, the, for ourselves and for the world that uh, God loves. Gracious God, today we remember before you your beloved flock that was directly traumatized by the events of September 11, 2001. As well as for all of us who were more indirectly affected, the horror of what we humans are capable of was not new to us, but it was shown to us with a special power that day and still reverberates. We pray for healing. We pray for your help to spread the antidote of your love and grace and healing. Antidotes needed also by particular persons we know who are suffering from one affliction, affliction or another, including those on our church prayer list. And we offer up all those friends and loved ones and prayer list members to you now. We also lift up the people of Great Britain in a moment of great transition that for some reaches deep into their very identity. And today we also remember and thank you for the blessings of life. <clears throat> These include people, friends, family, all the helpers, the ambulance and ER workers, the teachers, the attorneys, the counselors, and so very many more. These blessings also include pets and the beauty of nature, safe and attractive shelter, meaningful work to do. For all this and more, we thank you. And now praying together the prayer the Lord taught to his disciples, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand now and sing together our closing prayer, number four, uh, closing hymn, number 42. Thank you.
charge as a congregation is one that this faith community has taken on itself, wrote and approved itself. It's a charge to seek. And what is it that we're seeking? We are seeking to be a living testimony to God's love, grace, and mercy. The peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us now and remain with us always. Amen.